Welcome, everyone, to Coffee with the Codex, our first Coffee with the Codex of the 2023-2024 school year. Um, my name is Dot Porter, and I am a curator in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts in the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. I split my time between the Kislak Center and the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, um, which is a research and development institute um, that is in the Kislak Center. So that is a lot of fun. And so I spend my time with the manuscripts. Um, I do a lot of video work. I do digital humanities work. My background is medieval studies. Um, I love my job. It's really fun. And Copy with a Codex is my weekly 30 minute show and tell. This is when I take a book off the shelf and um, show it to you. And I'm really excited uh, that we're going to be doing some some different things a few times this year. Um, I'm going to be traveling to uh, the Free Library of Philadelphia in a few weeks to show you one of their manuscripts. They have an incredible collection. I'm going to be going to Bryn Mawr probably next year uh, to show one of their manuscripts. And also, um, I'm going to be doing an hour-long show with the folks at McGill University in Canada, either at the end of November or the beginning of December. Um, and we're going to compare and contrast uh, a couple of medical manuscripts from our collection. So some things to look forward to in addition to our regular Thursday meetings. If you are here, you have the link and password that you need to come any week. So you can you don't need to register for next week. You can just show up at noon on Thursday and I should be here. And if I'm not, I apologize. So with that all that out of the way, I'm so glad you're here. Um, this is pretty informal. Uh, if you've been here before, then you know, As you, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat. My colleague Amy Hutchins is here. Um, yes, Amy says, if you register, you receive a reminder, which is probably a good thing. Uh, Amy is our co-host, and she will be watching chat and answering questions. I will answer questions as we go. So let's get to it, because I love this manuscript, and I'm really excited um, to be able to show it to you. This is, I have been told uh, on good authority, the authority being Nicholas Herman, who is the Schoenberg curator of manuscripts here at Penn. So he is our big manuscript guy, that this is the oldest codex manuscript in Philadelphia. Um, codex being that it's a book that is uh, all put together as a book. We'll be looking at its structure because its structure is actually important to me uh, and hopefully will be to you as well when we're done, um, as opposed to uh, fragments. So they were, they were in fact, we have some older fragments in our collections, I think, and there are other fragments around, but this is a whole book. Um, it was written in the mid ninth century, so like circa 850, uh, but it was reused in the early 11th century, so like around the year 1000. So it had its first use um, in about 850 and then again 150 years later. Um, of interest, it was in the Phillips collection. I'll zoom in here so you can see this MSS Phillips. Uh, Sir Thomas Phillips was a major collector in England and he owned, I don't even know how many manuscripts he owned. He owned a whole lot. And so you get, you see Phillips manuscripts all over the place because when he died, they were sort of sold and distributed all over. And so this was one that was in his collection. It was probably rebound when it was in his collection. So this is a 19th century binding, uh, a very nice binding, but not medieval at all. Um, and in fact, the, the, here we have an owner stamp here, the LJS 101. LJS, if you have been here before, you've heard me say it, is the Lawrence J. Schoenberg collection. This is one of our major manuscript collections. Larry Schoenberg uh, collected manuscripts in the sort of late 20th and early 21st centuries. And uh, he passed away a few years ago and we now have his collection um, with us. So LJS 101. It starts actually in the middle of something. Um, so the, this page is um, 11th century. 
So what we have, I think of this as a manuscript, um, a manuscript sandwich almost. We have pages from the 11th century at the beginning and at the end, and then the middle part is the 9th century part. Um, so we have the conclusion of a grammatical work, and then there's a little poem here. I'll zoom in so you can get a better, sort of a better look at that. The writing is quite small. It is uh, Carolingian script. Um, this little bit is written in a slightly different, I don't know if that's different ink or if it's just that maybe they refreshed the ink uh, there. And then we come to the main text of the manuscript and it's got this gorgeous sort of, oh, what just happened? So we, we open up and this is a translation, most of this manuscript, it's a translation of a text by Aristotle um, called De Interpretatione, although the manuscript refers to it as periemenias, I think is how it's pronounced. So it's ca actually called something different. And this was a translation that was done into Latin from Greek by Boethius. So it's the text has this interesting history because it's written in the mid eighth century translation that was made by Boethius in the sixth century of this text originally written in Greek by Aristotle. The, yes, the, um, we have in the chat, uh, the P is quite impressive. It is quite impressive. Um, it's blue and orange and really, uh, really neat. And there's also this green highlighting here and we'll see the green highlighting a little bit more. There's also a little bit of blue and orange here in this. So there's a little bit of decoration. And this obviously, this is um, 11th century uh, decoration here. Um, there's a little bit of margin, marginal uh, notation here. Um, there's some, um, interlinear notation as well. So there's a little bit going on. So it looks like somebody wrote it and then someone else came through and maybe made some notes on it. Oh, Amy says Perimenias is the Greek title, which makes sense. Is the gold outline real gold? I I don't think it's it's not shining like gold. It's a little bit hard for me to say because it's quite early. I'm used to seeing gold in later manuscripts. Um, so it's possible that is it is gold and it's just prepared in a way that um, I can't, that, that I don't, it doesn't shine the way I would expect gold to though. So it may not be, I don't know if Amy has anything to add. No, she's shrugging. All right, so now we're gonna get to the interesting stuff. So this is, there's a few pages. There's actually four leaves of this sort of, um, 11th century part. There's a lot of um, stuff that's added in the margin, although this the main text is this uh, Boethia Aristotle uh, text. And then we get here, and this is where things get really interesting, I think, because this is where we're moving from 11th century to 9th century. And this is where you can really see the sort of process that was happening um, in the 11th century, this wasn't accidental. Um, it feels like they wanted a book. They wanted a, a book that was centered around this text. There are other texts in it that we'll look at when we get to the end. Um, and they had this earlier copy already there. And so it seems like the thought process is, well, we already have this. And maybe it was damaged because they replaced the earlier pages. And so they took the part that wasn't damaged and they said, okay, we'll, we'll use this as the sort of center of our book. And one of the things that you can look at that where you know that this is really a purposeful thing, there's a few things, but I like this one in particular. So we have the text of the, the text uh, coming down here. And then we have two words at the end of the line. And then the next word, and it's the middle of a sentence, and the next word picks up here. And you can see there's this line that the scribe has drawn here. Um, and this is because he knew what the next word was and he had to fill in the line. So he just sort of put in a line, like it's not even very decorative, it's just like fill in the line in um, because he knew exactly what was coming next. And then when we 
as and as we start going through the earlier part, you're going to see a lot of interlinear glosses, um, mostly, um, you know, sort of replacing things, basically bringing the text up to spec. So you can see there's some under dotting here which is deletion. So these they're saying ignore these words and add these other words. Um, they've also, I think that this is, that the color was added later. So they're also um, decorating it. Uh, so um, Luke is asking, are the pages parchment or vellum? So it's parchment definitely because it's made of animal skin and that's a general term. Whether it's made of um, calf, I don't, I don't actually know uh, the answer to that. Um, okay, so we're gonna keep going. And as we go through, you're gonna see more of these um, notations, marginal notations, uh, but I hope you can see, I didn't really point at it, but the, the writing is quite different. So the earlier script is larger, um, the later script is much smaller, but they're both technically Carolingian. Uh, Carolingian script, even though they look quite different. All right, so we're going through, and as I page through, another thing I like about this, since we're talking about parchment, um, is the uh, hair ver hair and flesh side of the of the manuscript. So parchment, it's made of animal skin. So you have one side of the page used to be on the outside of the animal and we call that hair, the hair side. And then the other side used to be on the inside of the animal and we call that flesh. And depending on how the parchment is made, you can, sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference, but sometimes you can tell. And this is actually an interesting spot in the manuscript because this is hair side and I'll pull the camera a little bit closer so we can see there's these, for one thing, the the parchment is quite dark in comparison. I hope you can see it's a little darker, but it also has little black spots all over it. The little black spots are hair follicles. So this was the outside of the animal and the flesh side tends to be lighter color in comparison with the other side, it tends to be a lighter color. And it also is lacking in uh, follicles. Although sometimes depending again on how uh, it's, it's made, if it's very thin, sometimes you can see hair follicles through it, but you just have to be able to like tell the difference between the sides. So that's sort of interesting. And here is, oh, and the reason that this is an interesting part is because it's a general rule in manuscripts made in Europe um, during the middle ages that hair faces hair and flesh faces flesh. So when they were making manuscripts, they would be careful to, to make sure that that to stack the sheets before they folded them so the hair and the flesh were facing each other. And so if you come to a spot in a manuscript where you have hair and flesh facing each other, it means that something is going on. Interesting. And what's happening here, I'm gonna give it away, is that these leaves have been uh, what's called misbound. So some of the pages, <laughs> are out of order in this manuscript. And it, I, hopefully there's time when we get through and I'll show you uh, more of this because it's interesting. I like to think that in the 19th century, maybe when Mr. Phillips was having his manuscript rebound, whoever was doing the rebinding um, tripped and fell and dropped all of the pages, all the leaves, and they went all over the place. And he just didn't do a very good job putting them back in the right order. Um, but. I don't actually know if that happened. It's just sort of fun to imagine. Here is another place where you have flesh and hair facing each other. So essentially this, wherever it started, this section here, there is something odd happening um, with this. And it's two sheets um, and we can see the, um, sewing down the middle. So we had two sheets that make four leaves that have been misbound here. And we can tell because of that hair and flesh. And also the text, the text is slightly out of order. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's see 
Luke, the calligraphy is incredibly clear. Yeah, compared to 15th century <laughs> documents, um, Carolingian script can actually be uh, very, very nice and clear. Here's another uh, marginal edition here, more of this um, hair follicles there. So I'm going to, this is, and this is all Boethius. This is all the Boethius translation. Um, another thing that you'll see as we go through is these little uh, holes down the sides of um, many of the, many of the leaves. These are called prick marks and they were used by the people who were um, preparing the parchment for writing uh, to draw lines. So the lines, it's really hard. I can sort of see them. Um, they have been, you can see them even better here. Uh, this is to mark the edge uh, where the scribe is supposed to write between these lines. Um, they're sort of blind ruled. So there's not filled in with ink or pencil. Sometimes they are. In this case, they aren't. And those prick marks are what are used to, um, to make sure the lines are drawn straight. All right. And there's not a lot of decoration in um, this part. There are these larger initials. There's this. That's uh, an O, a decorated O. It's Oratio. Um, but if you grew up in the 90s or the 80s, you might have seen an S that looks kind of like that. I like that. That's sort of amusing. Um, let's see. Oh, Amy in the chat makes the point that Italian humanists also uh, thought Carolingian script uh, was better than earlier scripts. And that's what the model that they used for humanistic script. Yeah. So when you get to um, a little bit later, the manuscripts get easier to read again. Gothic is actually, I find Gothic really hard to read, especially when you've got the minims. We'll probably look at some more of that. Oh, here's a little color, a little red. I don't know if all of the color was added later or if some of, if these red ones are, um, are earlier. Um, let's see. I know that here we go. So there are a few of these diagrams and I believe that this color was added um, so that we're still in this ninth century section. Um, but I have been told that the color was added um, later, added in the 11th century. I've also heard people who have looked at this say, actually, the color was added even later than that. But I don't know. We haven't done any kind of chemical analysis or anything on it, um, which might help. So you might look at this and say, well, so there's something also, something happening here. Um, the script changes slightly. Uh, we're still we're still in the earlier section, though. I looked into this because every time I get to this point in the manuscript, I think I think we've skipped, but we haven't. However, if you look at the text, there are two or three choirs that are missing here. Um, so there are originally it was originally a larger. Not only was there more at the beginning. Um, but there was also more in the middle here, and maybe there was a scribal change um, at some point in those sections. So, but we're still in the earlier part. You can see we still have a lot of these um, changes that are being done. More of these diagrams, however, these haven't been colored in, which is kind of interesting. Why did they? Um, why did they fill them in and not? So Martha says these are the squares of opposites. Yes, there it's all it's all it's all philosophy. It's all Greek philosophy to me. Uh, but it is sort of illustrating the points that are being made in there. So we should be getting close to the end of the early section. Here we go. And here's where we go back. So we're still not finished with the text. So we, um, but for whatever reason, again, I'm thinking it was a damaged manuscript. So we have to stop and then we pick up 
right where that leaves off on folio. We're now on folio 45. And then we keep going. And I like this section. It's got these sort of pretty, they're not colored in, but they're sort of decorative little initials there um, that are quite nice. Um, and different from the ones in the first few. Um, I feel, I'm not sure it's the same scribe who's done both sections, actually. I don't know. Um, all right. So we are getting towards the end a little bit. There's more sort of stuff going on. And then here we go. Be neat. We've reached the end. And then we have a little poem uh, that is here, the last few lines. And then somewhere around here, something interesting starts happening. Oh, that's a that's a pre preview. And then here's where this next text starts. And then we have another diagram. That's pretty fun. And then there's another diagram. This is interesting. Um, the parchment here is smaller. Oh, you can't see that. The parchment, it's like there's two sheets that were slightly smaller um, than the other one. Pull out a little bit. You can see that better. Two sheets in the middle of the choir that are shorter than the rest of them. So everything else in this book is pretty much the same size and these are, um, these are smaller, sort of interesting. I don't, there's nothing textually happening there. All right, then we have another poem here. And this is where things get really interesting to me. I don't know. Um, this text on the left is the beginning of a sample letter of a monk to an abbot. So it's sort of like, if you are a monk and you want to write a letter to your abbot about whatever, I don't know, uh, there is someone who's been working on this. I don't know if he ever um, published it, but um, there's a lot going on. There's the main text and then there's marginal notes and interlinear, all kinds of stuff. And then the next page is completely different. Um, it's just regular text that sort of starts in the middle. But then if we turn a couple of pages, it looks like this again. And that's because we have another example of um, things being misbound, leaves being misbound. And what specifically has happened here, if we look here, that's thread that's the center of this gathering or choir of uh, four leaves. So we have two sheets, that's one choir. And then this leaf, which is the start of this letter is actually the last leaf of the previous choir. And how many leaves does this choir have? This has one, two, three. Oh, this is the one that has the four. This is the one that has these shorter leaves. And then here's the center of this one. Um, so what I think uh, is pretty clear happened is this was originally a choir of, what is this? One, two, three, four, uh, eight, a choir of 12 leaves. And it came apart and this section was inside this section originally, um, because that would explain if, if this was taken out and put inside, then these two leaves would be facing each other. Another thing is that if you look at these, these leaves here that sort of come between the two parts of the monk's letter, it's more of the Boethius text, which ends here before this next this choir starts. So that sort of explains everything. I don't know if that, I hope that makes sense to you. It's just interesting to see how the this book 
that we have is not really the same as the book that was in the 11th century and not obviously not in the ninth century. It's been changed a lot. Even pretty recently, it's been changed. Even I think accidentally, I don't think anybody would purposefully, um, you know, bind it out of order, but this is the kind of thing that happens. Um, so that's one of the things I really, really love about this one is it's just a great example of the kind of stuff that I love the most about working with these books is that it's not only about the people who are writing them at the time they were being written, but everything that happened to them later, including what's happening to them, to them today and that I have it here and I can show it to you um, and, and talk to you about it. So it's just a great, and it's old, which is pretty neat um, there. And then we get to the ending. And the ending of it is after the letter, it's just, I think the, the record says miscellaneous verses, definitions, and biblical commentary. So it's sort of at the end, they just sort of wrote in whatever they wanted. Um, we're almost done. The last thing I want to say is that it seems a little random. And I always thought of this as being a pretty random manuscript because you, you start out with, with grammar at the very beginning, and then you have this huge you know, section that's all um, Boethius's translation of Aristotle. And then there's a like a letter from the monk to the abbot, and there's a couple of poems, and then there's this biblical commentary. And I think the latest um, suggestion that I've heard from people who have, who have done a lot more work on it than I have is that it's an example of um, the trivium, which was part of the uh, Carolingian um, educational system, the way that they taught people. And so if you look at the texts that are in here, it's, I can't remember what the, exactly what the trivium, but, but that's what it's doing. So it's not random. Somebody put it together purposefully to serve, you know, a purpose that we're still sort of trying to figure out. So it's 1230 and I got to talk about like my favorite book. Uh, I'll be back next Thursday um, at noon. And thank you so much for being here. I hope I hope you'll come back. I think we're looking at, uh, yeah, LJS 41, which is the book of Esther. This is so pretty. I'm really excited. Um, so I hope you'll come back. Thank you all for coming and have a good week.